Hello, folks. Hello, Taylor. Good morning. Good morning, Vic. Good morning, Victor. Let's see. Howdy folks, um, please add your name and any agenda items to the meeting notes. We'll get started at five after. The link to the Google Doc, the meeting notes is in the Zoom chat. It's also in the calendar, I think, event, um, and in CNCF Slack. We'll get started in about five minutes. I'm sorry, we'll get started at five after in about one minute. All right. We'll get started. So this meeting is uh, being recorded. This is uh, Monday, so you know, Forking Group. It'll be published on the CNCF YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, please add 
your name and any agenda items to the meeting notes. If you have any and you can't reach the notes and agenda item, then you can drop a message in the chat, um, the Zoom chat right now, or speak up. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? I'll go ahead and share my screen. Can folks hear me? Yeah, Loud and yes. All right. All right. Well, you can add your name to the attendees whenever. Um, let's see. So other than the upcoming events, uh, the tag is um, August 2nd, Monday. Um, we have KubeCon and ONES in October. The CFPs are closed for that. <clears throat> if someone has something interesting that's going to be on one of those, if you've been accepted, then Maybe we can add that as a list to the list that folks are recommended to see. I'll drop the pull request to the end of this so we can take a look at whatever's there. And then Tal, um, you're up for the CNF operators. I can, I'm gonna let you share screen because I know it's a pretty big uh, doc. Sure, that's that's a good idea. Um, let me do that. Uh, here we go. Did that work? I can see it. Okay, good. So um, yes, I've been promising this for a while, and it's finally ready. Uh, and uh, started to get feedback from colleagues. And of course, I would very much appreciate feedback from this group. So it's a very long document. It's, as I said, it's uh, 15 pages in length, um, not in a format that could immediately be usable uh, within our working group, but um, uh, maybe parts of it can be, or it could be the starting point for uh, best practices. It is not written as best practices. It is written more of a discussion of the problem field uh, solutions and um, uh, divided, I guess, into two. There's, first of all, a discussion of the operator pattern more generally. And then there's another section here. I hope you can see the table of contents here on the left, which is practical considerations. And here, I think maybe we, we're getting more into things that could be best practices uh, in terms of uh, implementations having to do with Kubernetes specifically. And those of you who have been following the, the Slack conversations, um, you know, Ian raised a very good point about CRDs being requiring administrator permission. So I go into quite some length into alternatives to that, <laughs> which I discussed. So again, I'm not going to, going to read this whole document right now. I'm just giving you an overview of how it's structured and what the purpose is. Um, uses for the operator pattern are, I think, again, where um, uh, it could be interesting for us, where I, I go into some CNF-specific aspects, but some aspects are not specific to CNF. They're really specific to any cloud uh, workload or and Kubernetes workload. So again, going into detail. And of course, I would be very happy to hear feedback if there's uh, uses that I've missed uh, or uses that I can go into more detail or, of course, got wrong. So any of you can comment on this. As I uh, uh, noted in Slack, so just be aware that um, this document is publicly, globally viewable and 
commentable. <laughs> Uh, the reason I did that is, well, that's the only way I really have to share a Google Doc with, with this group. I'm not able to share it from my uh, Red Hat account. Um, yes, another point to mention, uh, when I discuss the operator pattern uh, more generally, I do have to get a little bit into uh, what I call a terminological soup. Um, what is called operators in Kubernetes is actually has nothing specifically to do with the operator pattern. And even in Kubernetes and in a lot of presentations, people talk about the operator pattern in Kubernetes and they usually talk mean, well, uh, CRDs, custom resource definitions and a custom controller built around it. That doesn't necessarily apply the uh, operator pattern in the uh, classical sense in which it's been used for more than 20 years right now. Uh, computationally. So I, I go to some length to actually separate these two. Uh, maybe it's a little bit pedantic, but uh, that's the kind of person I am. I feel like uh, these two things should be understood. So despite the terminological soup, I think we can uh, get through those uh, problems of names and really uh, most of the document is discussing the meat of the issue. So yes, there's a lot here to go over. I'm, I'm not gonna, as I said, read it all right now, but I would be happy and honored if people in this group would uh, read through it, provide comments. You can add comments directly in the Google Doc. And, um, oh, and I should also mention, I realize not everybody has access to Google. So uh, just please ask me, I can provide a PDF too, although that will be a snapshot. This is a living document, I'm constantly editing it. So um, I could provide a PDF of a snapshot right now. And, uh, Pretty much it. I wonder if there's any general questions or, or comments. Well, if not, then I, what I could suggest is homework. Whoever is interested, read this. And maybe next meeting, we can circle back and discuss, well, what do we do with this? What can we do with this, if at all? Um, and uh, that's it for me. Hey, Paul, I just have a question. I will. Um, I haven't read the document yet, so probably. But I, do you have any conclusion at the end of the document or anything that you um, final thoughts in? That ah, you have that, <laughs> that that that's a good point. I, I probably should add <laughs> a section like that. I, I tend to think of those things as being obvious. Yes, I, this is very opinionated, uh, written in a very opinionated way. Um, I, I guess the conclusion is yes, operators are, are very important and useful. Um, and um, uh, there are some practical challenges, uh, numerous ones that I uh, discussed briefly, but they're probably worth going into more detail on our end. Um, as I said, things like the CRD and what to do with it, things having to do with namespaces. I see Ian already wrote a comment. Uh, uh, and, and we're, we're going to discuss the next aspect of the agenda is the aspect of privileges and how, how do we deal with the uh, containers that require privileges? Well, that's true for operators as well, um, or at least operators that do work as a Kubernetes workloads, right? Because they could they might also require things like special host access, et cetera. That's, that's actually quite common for networking solutions, right? Um, And yeah, the other aspect I talk about is, well, it's very hard to write good operators. Um, I leave it to the end, but that's kind of a, that, that, that's a big deal. I'm, I'm very concerned about the quality of operators that I see sometimes, and there's really no simple way around this. <laughs> They're just complicated because of the, the way Kubernetes is designed. Um, and, um, yeah, my, my conclusion is I, I, I strongly believe that this is one of the killer features of uh, Kubernetes. And um, I would love to see our working group, you know, take operators seriously as a general concept and then think of how they can uh, work with a lot of the best practices that we suggest. So, um, but, but thank you for the question. I think I might actually make that explicit and add a section at the end of which is uh, kind of the bottom line. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, 
thanks. We can continue with the agenda. <laughs> Sorry, I do have one more point. I've just written a note in there, um, and I think it's worth mentioning because um, it seems important. Uh, one of the things you were saying in the, and I, let's be honest, I haven't read the entirety of the document, but one of the things you mentioned here is um, that you could be providing the operator from the system to many containers. And, you know, that I think is the obvious, well, if you're doing that, you need to sort of define what you're providing. And it seems to me if you're doing that, you're actually providing something a bit more as a service, a li little more like, um, to take a bad example, um, EKS, you're providing something that delivers a service. You're not providing an orchestrator that will orchestrate, you know, container images that the, um, the CNF, you're not likely to be providing something that orchestrates container images the CNF brings along with it. So I'm not, it, it's got a useful, or, or it's, there are certainly potential uses for that, but we might want to draw our boundaries so the thing you deliver is more testable. It's very hard to test something that orchestrates container images that don't live with it, but it's quite reasonable to deliver something where the end result is, you know, a service, a microservice that might form part of the application, but you can detail what the microservice is good for. That, that, that's a very good point. I originally, I actually, when I started the document, I had a section exactly about that. How do we differentiate between what's part of the platform, right? What you're calling here mm -hmm. as a service rather than part of your workload. I ended up breaking up that discussion into, it, it's, it's woven through the document, but you're making me think right now that it, it's worth highlighting as its own section and maybe, um, I'm not sure, I wonder if it's, here's, here's my thinking on this is that I, I think in, to an extent that's a practical consideration because in the end, whether it's provided as part of the platform, you know, who's providing it, if it's a third party uh, operator that you're using or, or it's the CNF vendor who actually developed and packaged it as something specialized, um, there, there's an extent in which that doesn't matter. That ends up being an implementation detail, right? If you need administrative rights or not uh, to install it. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, think it, I, I think you're right. I think it is worth addressing uh, more generally. And uh, I, I, yeah, I agree with- I, I, I wouldn't necessarily change this document. I think this document actually fills people's heads with the background. Um, I mean, there might be a comment worth throwing in about what I just said, but- um, what you're then saying is, given the implementation of this document, what approaches could we take? Um, and we don't have to basically wall off approaches and say this is never going to work, which frankly is, you know, not a given anyway. But <clears throat> as an example, one approach is, well, you can bring just the operator, okay? Um, not from the CNF, it's a part of, the, it, it's provided independently of the CNF. You can bring the operator and the um, software it's operating on. So ultimately you're delivering an as a service API um, supported independently of the CNF. And then you can bring, obviously if you bring it as part of the CNF, then you're bringing both operator and the software package together and they come as part of the CNF and they belong to that CNF. No other CNF will use it. Those are three patterns. I would personally discard the operator alone one out of hand because I don't think you can easily define what an operator is doing if you don't describe what software package, you know, the container image it's operating on. It doesn't travel together because again, I don't think you can test it. Um, but the other two, you know, we can say, well, if you're gonna do A, then you do it like this. If you're gonna do B, then you do it like this. Um, so we, we can take possible implementations, measure it up with the information you've provided here and say, it's got strengths and weaknesses, and in general, we would or would not recommend it. Yeah, that, that's, I think, where we would go within the work group. Uh, I'll, I'll add, you know, the, the general topic is here, are, are the CNF requirements extending beyond what the platform provides, right? Part of the problem of Kubernetes, if, if you want to consider it a problem or maybe a challenge, is that um, 
no two distributions are equal. And even within the telco, you know, they could create clusters with a certain, certain base requirements. So when, when you're targeting a CNF, you have to list, well, what are the requirements for the CNF? And they can be things like SDN environment, uh, top of the shelf uh, uh, switches, you know, th there's top of the rack switches, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, requirements that go beyond just what Kubernetes provides as a platform in itself, mm -hmm. right? There, you might need certain CNI plugins uh, installed. Um, so an yeah. operator becomes another aspect of those those requirements. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah so, so this is where it bleeds into exactly, I think, the next item on the agenda, which is, you know, privileges, right? Privileges are also a kind of requirement. Um, I require yeah. privileges, yeah. access to the host. Uh, yeah, there's, yeah. there's yeah. an underlying thing that doesn't hide among, among privilege, but it's more a matter of um, if I'm going to, and I, I'm using air quotes here, if I'm going to right size the cloud, if I'm going to build a cloud that will specifically run this kind of network function from this, this provider, then I'm going to have to meet its requirements for the cloud because there's not one deployment of Kubernetes with one configuration. Um, that's a separate topic to both of them that I would want to say, well, these are the features I'm going to come looking for and they better be present, which could include, I need an operator that provides ultimately when I run it, a function that does something. And mm -hmm. Um, you know, and that would go hand in hand with I need Multis and I need the SRV plugin and I need Numer Awareness and I need whatever else it is that I need out of the cloud. Um, so I think that's another one we could write. And again, we cross the line between uh, simply describing a best practice and standardizing it, which we might want to do sort of as a sideline rather than with the authority of the CNF working group. But if we said, right, well, if you're going to provide a, network, uh, a CNF, it's got to come with a manifest that details its requirements from the cloud, and it might require operators, then, you know, if we go into, well, the system will provide operators, then those things knit together at that point. Right. And, and this is, again, where I see the, the big benefit of operators, because it lets you encapsulate, encapsulate those requirements with you know, a single item on the list, you know, this is, I need this operator. Now that mm. operator by itself has, have all kinds of requirements, but you're, uh, you're not passing the buck here. You're really saying that this is, um, you know, another system that you need. So the CNF itself becomes more minimal, right? There, there are less moving parts in the CNF itself. And those moving parts are moved elsewhere in areas where, um, um, it, it could even be a third party, you know, another vendor, uh, it, it, yeah, it, um, I, I mean, or, or not, as the case may be. Or not, now, exactly, least, if, or not. If it's supplied by the CNF vendor, then the point is it would become, it wouldn't necessarily become a responsibility of the CNF supporting ops team. It might become a responsibility of the platform supporting ops team, exactly. at which point privilege is less of a problem because everything the platform ops team does implicitly has all the privileges in the world. So that one might solve itself if we approached it that way. Um, it's true, you know, I, I can't give all these details, but I'm, I'm working right now uh, on, on a few projects with vendors and, you know, the, the reality is very messy. Uh, CNS <laughs> require a, a lot, a lot of things that kind of break the, the lovely cloud separation, right? Uh, I, I think we can forget about ever having CNFs running on public clouds, at least not the way public clouds are currently designed. It ends up being very custom. That's my point. That you have, it's a CNF plus a very tweaked uh, Kubernetes cluster <laughs> that is designed to work together with hardware accelerators, other things that sometimes come with their own operators, and um, the, the complete solution. You, you know, you have a bill of materials for everything, going from the hardware to the software, and all these parts are really designed and certified to work together. So, so in the end, you know. Um, making these kind of clean separations between which team works on what, um, I, I, I hope we can reach that point. I mean, I think that's something that we would like to see. Those are one of the benefits of the cloud and what it can give us. Uh, we, we have a ways to go to that and maturity both in the platform and in our development practices, which is part of what this uh, group, I hope, will move forward, right? Yeah, the, the question there is gonna be, can you, 
for a CNF, given what it's got to do, can the whole group of people involved supply a CNF with more moving parts with less effort than they can supply it with fewer, bigger moving parts, even if that includes a bit of duplication? Um, and at least with the level of technology and, frankly, people um, skills that we have around at the moment, I think the duplication might make life easier. But it's it's a topic open for discussion. We shouldn't block off the option in the future. We might not necessarily take the option on day one. Right. I, I think our attitude so far, which I agree with very strongly, is that we keep we're, we're, we're going with the method of like, if you want to do this, then this is your best practice. We, it's very hard for us to state an opinion where you, you shouldn't do something, some things, right? There, there's a reality out there in terms of uh, uh, what uh, telcos need, what providers can provide, and, and that relationship, which, you know, we, we can't change that business relationship. What we can do is look at how those relationships manifest in practice and with those manifestations, here's what we're recommending. Uh, th that's the right attitude for us to take. Uh, well, thanks, good discussion. <laughs> we'll continue it. All right. Um. Ian and I have been working on some material for related to the principle of the least privilege. Probably be multiple best practices that end up coming out of this as well as maybe a couple of use cases. <clears throat> but uh, Ian, would you like to go? I, I just put some of the bullet points based on what we've been doing. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I mean, so let's start from the beginning. The principle of least privilege is not a use case, and it's not a best practice either. It's um, it's a well principle. But the reason it's not a use case is because I need to be doing it for a reason, um, and it's not a reason just because I say it's a principle. Um, so I've got to justify it. The reason it's not a best practice is it's not measurable. Um, so I can't say you shall have least privilege because you know, someone's going to say, well, this is the least privilege. It just happens that I need like root access to the whole system to get things working. So so it, it's an unmeasurable um, statement as it comes. So to break it down into use cases and best practices, uh, you need to delve into it a bit and see what's coming. And and we, Taylor and I spent a long while discussing this and we've got piles of notes and those notes are, well, I can share them if you want, but they're not terribly human readable and they might be rude as well. I'm not actually sure what we wrote at this point. But um, what, the way we found that this was leading was effectively um, the principle of least privilege is a consequence of wanting your applications not to affect each other if you've got more than one of them. And your, applica your application to stand separate from the platform. So the application can't break the platform that it's running on top of, which it absolutely can with lots of privileges you give it. Um, and if you start with that as your reasoning, then the principle of least privilege sort of falls out of that. The more privilege you get, the more you can do things that you should under no circumstances be allowed to do. If I have access to host networking, I can basically break my worker off from the rest of the cluster because I can break the host networking. I can probably get onto the management network because I have host networking. For instance, the, the, these are the sort of things that start to look dangerous. Um, so. From there, you end up dropping out things like, well, this is a thing I should not ever do. Um, one other thing, because we're in a real world here, not um, in the, um, the world that we might wish to be in, is that we know full well that pretty much every CNF that exists in the world is not sticking to the principle of least privilege. It, it lays um, its hands on all the privileges available to it. Capnet admin is a particular favorite. Um, to to get the forms of networking in the absence of something that would allow them to do that without grabbing all the privileges. Um, so this one is a procedural point, but I think what we have to work out as we come to uh, best practice baselines is how somebody would document their compliance with that baseline. They would probably say, um, they would probably say, this is what I'm doing 
um, um, yeah, they, they, they would probably say, this is what I'm doing. Um, and it's not compliant with all of the best practices. And I have an exception. And this is the reason for it. So, you know, when they have non-compliance, they would want to document why they've got non-compliance and maybe what they're going to do in the future to remove that non-compliance. Um, so we should be thinking in those terms, but we, we will build best practices. We can't limit ourselves to best practices that everybody already does. We have to come up with, we're going to come up with best practices that people don't do. And so we're going to have to give them a way of saying, well, I'm not compliant. This is why I'm not compliant. This is how I'm going to become compliant. Um, anyway, the the um, the privileges we looked at, and Taylor's been kind of um, making notes. Right, he basically said, right, I want my uh, platform to have integrity, independent of the app that's running. I want applications not to be. Uh, again, if we're talking in the world of vendors, I bought my applications. I don't want one vendor to point to another vendor as the reason why their application is not working. Um, um yeah uh so um uh what was i saying um so we we went through some of the standard ways of um using least privilege right one is again as i say documenting your exceptions where you can't basically run with zero privilege but at least you can explain what you're doing with that privilege um that would potentially give us ways of documenting, you know, best practices if, if you're going to use CatNet admin, these are the rules you must follow and these are how we will check that you are following those rules as an example, bad example, but it will do. Um, uh, when it comes to a few other things, I know we discussed rooting containers. I know Tal has a specific interest about rooting containers because OpenShift tends to deny you the use of the root user in containers, theoretically, the root user in containers does not endanger other applications or the platform at all. So it's got a slightly different use case. The reason you don't want root in containers is because it limits the damage a compromised app can do to itself or a broken, as in a flaw application can do to itself. Um, unrestricted access to Kubernetes APIs is obviously dangerous. There are Kubernetes applications, uh, APIs that you probably wouldn't want an application to access. We might want to set some rules around this. The obvious one to my mind is um, when we talk about cluster-wide resource types, I think network attachments are probably the most dangerous. Um, as an application, I don't have the context of how the cloud is connected to the wider network. Um, so I can't just say use VLAN on this port without really that consideration. Um, and there are certain VLANs and certain ports that are probably you know, outside the scope of what I'm allowed to do. And there are certain attachment points that are probably designed for other CNS to be using, which I absolutely shouldn't be fiddling with. So um, we need to figure out for an application, what Kubernetes APIs should it be allowed access to? And what shouldn't it be allowed access to? And what would I want to delegate on a case by case basis? Like, for instance, again, access to an existing network attachment so that you can attach a network function to it would be an obvious thing to give to a network function. You know, I, I want your input to be here. I want your output to be over there. I don't let you decide which VLAN that is, but when I've actually selected it, a little like Kubernetes and like Neutron's networks, uh, once the network is made, you can use it, but you can't make the network in the first place. Um, we talked about CRDs um, a lot already. Um, Just a quick question about that, if I may. I, I feel like it's a, a separate aspect here. You know, you're, you're t we're talking about privileges, but also you're talking about rights and service account RBAC roles. Um, a yeah. privileged container doesn't have unrestricted access to Kubernetes APIs. That's no unrelated, Agreed. right? Agreed, but we're not talking about containers with what Kubernetes calls privilege. We're talking about the privileges that in general that software has, which among other things is access to the Kubernetes API at all and access to items on it. So I want to keep that to the smallest set that's meaningful, that allows me to do the job uh, and say, well, you shouldn't be doing this because this is more privileged than you absolutely need. 
So whether so don't, it's, don't whether it's as... privileged, whether you, it's a privileged container, quote unquote, or, or not, we're just saying whatever the application is, however it's running, then try to limit the scope that it has on affecting other apps as well as itself and the system. So it's yeah. Okay, because specifically. All right, um, because you know root and containers is you know a very specific aspect of privileged containers. Yeah. There are other alternatives to that too. Providing capabilities for containers rather than outright privilege, you could use uh, yeah. Linux capabilities. Um, so again, that's least privilege. Instead of going completely privileged, instead of setting privilege true, you can ask for specific capabilities. Um, and yeah, those the, the, yes, are also, absolutely. Yeah. So, so the privilege, the, there's two parts to this. One is the principle of least privilege literally means you have only the privilege required to get your job done and no more. Um, but again, the use cases we might write up here are things like privileges that exceed a certain threshold that endanger the stability of the platform, for instance, um, should not be given to applications. Your privilege, you know, I could turn that around. You only get the privileges you need to do the job, but you are explicitly not allowed to have privileges that stop other people doing their job. Um, yeah, okay. And, and, and the thing that makes me a little bit uh, uncomfortable in this particular path is uh, is that the the like I, the under, the understanding in terms of at least privileges is that the application says these are my these are my minimum requirements. So if you end up with a with a pod that says I need capability net admin, the amount of damage I could do with that, despite the fact it's not root, it's not sysadmin, is absolutely immense, and it's very close to. Yeah, very close to having root access to to the system. So uh, that's so. So I think from a from a guidance perspective, like we cannot say no, you can't have this. Like we're we're not in the we're not in the uh, space to say where we're going to block you from having it. But guidelines would say like if you really need something like uh, cap net admin, uh, you should very, the best practice should be to separate that component from the rest of your application and put it into an isolated area so that the attack surface is significantly smaller so that when your system is compromised, not if, but when it is, that mm -hmm. they don't gain all these additional privileges simply because they happen to break in through some, uh, through, through the front door. Yeah, very good point. I'll add, you know, if we could make suggestions upstream, uh, it, it's a problem in Kubernetes. It's very, very coarse. It's kind of uh, if you open the gate, you open the gate for a lot of things. Uh, even if you want to enable ping from a container, you're going to have to have privileges that you can create a lot of damage with, right? There's, uh, there, there are solutions, right? Things like Cilium and other things that let you have much more control over the security in, in your container. But Kubernetes out of the box is, uh, doesn't care. <laughs> Yeah, cap, uh, CapNet raw, you can use to respond to ARP requests, do ARP poisoning. Uh, you can do DNS poisoning depending on uh, depending on your infrastructure uh, because it allows you to craft and uh, random packets and listen promiscuously. So like these, these, are, these are privileges that they look small in, in, in the front, but they actually have huge implications for, for an attacker. And uh, that doesn't mean you don't need cabinet raw or you shouldn't have it, but if you but if you do need it, you want to try to isolate that into into a different location. Like this is my control part and this is where most of my application exists. That's the dangerous part right there that I've isolated so I can better defend it. Yeah, and, and I think the um the point I was making about rules and exceptions is important here. I mean I, I remember doing this for um coding standards of all things. We, we years ago I was in safety critical software and we had a bunch of coding standards and you followed the coding standards unless you couldn't follow the coding standards and then you wrote up an exception for the specific place where you weren't following the coding standard and why and why it was okay to do that in this one instance and that was all perfectly acceptable we can do the same thing here i don't think it's possible to write for instance a best practice of if you're going to use catnet admin this is how you use it i think it is possible to write a best practice this is if you're going to use CapNet Admin, 
or sorry, don't use cabinet admin, and then an exception process that says, well, you get to explain to the person who's going to operate this, this network function, why your use of network admin in this one case is acceptable and not dangerous and so on and so forth, using any of the suggestions that uh, Frederick was saying there, or any others, up to you. But, you know, you aren't following the best practice, but you're at least explaining your reason. So just another point, I think Frederick uh, pulled us into uh, maybe too far here. We're not talking about security, right? Attack vectors, things like that. We're not, <laughs> the vendor is not going to attack anything. Uh, I, th I think the principles here about uh, words we mentioned are integrity, uh, damage. Uh, I don't think we're, what, so, the, the topic I, here is security, I, I think. I, I will, <laughs> I will point it, out. It be, it, it's, it's a defense in depth. Thing. So it can be security as well, but it goes hand in hand with, frankly, software never does what you expect it to do. So if I hand, you know, a network function, a bunch of privileges, I don't know what it's going to do with them. Um, either way, whether it's doing them because its code is broken or whether it's doing them because someone's invaded it and is starting to try and dig for, a, a, you know, an escalation of the footprint, foothold they've already got doesn't really matter as because the point is the, the wall is effectively the same thing. Um, I don't give you more rights than you need to do the job, which means that were you to be compromised, there isn't anything you can do that is dangerous to other things I might be running. Um, yeah, I, okay. I will, I, yeah. I'd like to point out that uh, integrity and availability are, are straight up uh, in the security domain as well. So if you look at any security literature on what security is, they, all, they always point to the CIA triad, which is the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so, uh, they, these are, are very cross-cutting concerns. And of course, you can have integrity and availability with, without focusing on the security aspect. Uh, but in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of that particular path, uh, even just looking at the stability of the system, like how robust is the system? If the system has the capability to use foot guns on itself and, the, it's, in, and its infrastructure, you're going. You're opening yourself up to to more risk, um, and so this it's a oh. it's a principle that uh, where you have good cohesion and you also have good loose coupling, where you couple to something that has that privileges, and that thing that has that high privileges can be better audited. Right. Absolutely. I'll, I'll say that. Just uh, let's take into account that we're not discussing security in general here. You know, we're. Uh, security is a much bigger topic than just this. It's, as you said, it's part of the domain, but uh, we're, we're not really dealing here with attacks, right? Uh, uh, actual attacks are something we should discuss, right? How, how, what are the best, uh, best practices for security in Kubernetes? That's a very, very big topic, and uh, a lot of companies are working on outside of telco. Um, we're we're yeah. specifically talking about one sub area of security principle of least privilege we're not taking on all of it it's fine if they come up in comments and they have like there's a lot of other um best practice ideas that we've noted while working on this one but the focus for this is primarily on least privilege Correct. I'm just, I'm not sure I would even call it security, but okay. Yeah, I, I mean, from the surface, then uh, again, a CNF that's gone insane and a CNF that's been compromised um, are very different things, obviously. But from underneath, right, a CNF that has gone insane and a CNF that's been compromised are going to try and do the same things. They, they could do... Um, they, they will use whatever privilege they have in unpredictable ways. And so making sure that they don't have any more privilege than they need is a means to make sure that they, they don't start doing damage. The damage doesn't spread. Yeah, and, and typically when you start to get to the largest organizations, uh, what, when they talk about security, what they really mean is risk, uh, is risk management. So and what, what is the risk this thing is, is presenting to me? Is this a risk that I can accept based upon the business requirements? Uh, or do I need to do something else like mitigate or eliminate or transfer the risk somewhere? And so it's, it's in a, a code that is acting up, you know, even if it's just 
uh, someone, a developer makes a mistake and accidentally starts deleting databases. Like that is seen as, a, as part of the security domain uh, within, within many organizations or most organizations at scale because it's considered to be part of that, uh, part of that risk. And so at, at, the end, at, at the end, I think the security aspect does, does matter here. Uh, and we can tie this into where we can scope the, the part that's, that we're looking at and we're saying, hey, we're only looking at princ principles of least privilege for, for this. And if it makes sense to slowly, to slowly expand it out, we, we certainly can. Um, all right, sure. So I'll, I'll add another point then, you know, um, privileges having to do with the writing uh, to disk, which every container has. This is a topic that's very dear to uh, my colleague Sean's heart right now, uh, logging. Kubernetes, it is not throttled in any way. You can you can think of it as a denial of service attack if that's what somebody wants to do, but uh, a wild out of control uh, container that just logs too much can bring the whole system down. Yeah, um, I, I think that's an interesting category of um, isolation perhaps rather than principle of least privilege, but I absolutely agree there are certain things where Kubernetes does not constrain resources. Uh, you know, we talked about etcd and you could probably overload it if you really put your mind to it. You're absolutely right on the logging things. I'm sure there are only two of, I'm sure we'd come to others if we actually went lucky. But yeah, where a resource is shared, but it's not shared with any degree of enforcement, you have a problem. If you want true isolation, you need virtual machines. That's basically, uh, containers were not designed for it. K Kubernetes is designed from a point of view of trusting uh, your applications, right? Um, well, it, it, it's at least designed or not, it's definitely used in the sense that a single application is running off. So, you know, if the application breaks because Kubernetes is being abused, then it's still the application team's problem because Kubernetes is a component that they're supporting. But that isn't the world we're expecting to move to here because the application and the Kubernetes platform come from potentially two different sources. Um, that, that, that's a point you made a few, time, a few times and I, I really wonder how, um, how true that is that these, these teams should be separate. Uh, well, so would you like to sell OpenShift to service providers? Me personally, sure, let's sell it. <laughs> Anybody right. would buy it, right? But, um, but are, 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 you planning, are, are you planning on writing the entirety of a mobile packet call? Because if you're not, then you can't sell the whole solution. You can only sell OpenShift. So. Well, I, can... I'm not talking about who's writing the code for the platform. It's who's, who's actually managing it, right? Um, but again, right, they'll come to you because you sold them OpenShift with support. And OpenShift broke because an application is doing something stupid. Why should that be on you? I, I, don't, I don't really understand your point, sorry. <laughs> the, the, the point I'm making is that as a vendor, taking one example of this relationship, and, and it's a perfectly good one. If I'm selling you a piece of software, I want it to break if I did something wrong. And I want it to break when I can fix it because I don't, I, I, a support contract is a gamble. Um, it's the gamble that you won't make so much work for me that I don't make profit. Um, and in order for that to be true, then the consequences need to be consequences I brought upon myself by writing bad code in the first place. So I have some control over the amount of support that you will ask from me. If we're saying that I can't support platform without also knowing everything about the way the application is running on it, then I don't understand how we can make this ever work in the service provider. So we, well, you know, this is one of the ways in which we constrain platform teams to basically dig their own hole and not have other people dig holes for them. Well, well you know, we're not talking about pass, you know, platform as a service here. We're, we're talking about uh, ownership of the network, right? You know, even the, the, the title here of this point is platform integrity, but we're talking about CNF best practice practices to maintain platform integrity. Yeah. Um, everybody's responsible here. Uh, you know, you're, you're responsible for the end to end uh, of the network. So which parts of the software you call platform and which aren't are, um, you know, it's software that you're using. It's all integrated. 
Yeah, but I'm a service provider. I'm trying to run a mobile network and it breaks. Who do I call? Um, prob probably a lot of people, right? But, <laughs> uh... but the, the thing is, that may well be true. I mean, but in an ideal world, I know who to call. It's mm. one team who's not living up to the responsibilities I set for them, which is why it's useful to, again, it may not be perfect, but it's useful to put boundaries between components. So you can say, this is not doing its job. It's your problem. You fix it as soon as possible. The, the best resolution to, you know, what could potentially be an expensive network outage is that I point to the right person, the right person makes a one line change in whatever they're responsible for and the whole thing starts working again. The worst solution to that is I can't honestly tell which of the many teams that I'm working with is responsible for the problem and I have to call them up at 3 a.m. on a Sunday and, you know, then they argue among themselves trying to point the finger at each other and maybe I get this sorted in a week while I'm not making any money because my mobile network's down and the government's on my back. So. Right, it, it's, our... but there, there are certain expectations for what this particular platform provides, say, versus OpenStack, right? So you just don't have the isolation. Uh, containers don't really isolate. So it, it, it's a different kind of environment, I think, uh, a different kind of platform. Yeah, and, and it may be that we're not expecting it to be as robust, resilient as, as virtual machines are. Um, but on the other hand, we get benefits in terms of better. Uh, you know, it, it, it's smaller, it's lighter weight, it's more operable. But um, on the other hand, you know, where we can set boundaries on this, we can improve the whole thing, right? It's not about perfect, it's about better than better than you might end up with if you didn't. Right, yeah, this is, I, I know, sorry, I feel like uh, we're, we're really get, getting off track here, but uh, my point is I'm happy where this started, where we talked about a principle of, of least privilege. It's a good principle, it has a lot of advantages. Uh, moving it into the general issue of security, security is a very important topic. I think we need to discuss it unrelated to this principle at all. There's a lot of issues having to uh, having to do yeah. with that. And they're, they're not necessarily related to what the CNF uh, uh, developer can do. You know, they're, they're just problems or challenges, I would say, with the technology itself. Well, all right, let's, let's turn this around. The thing I said to begin with, was that the principle of least privilege can't be a use case and it can't be a best practice by itself. So you need a use case that justifies the things that the principle of least privilege applies. What use case would you use? No, I, I, I think you're right. It's a general principle. I mean, there are use cases where this would come up maybe more than others, right? Uh, those use cases where you need privileges, right? Um. Yeah, but I mean, it's not necessarily use cases where you need privileges. If you need privileges and there are no consequences to certain categories of privilege, because fine, you can break the platform, but that's fine, apparently. Then, you know, that's a use case where it, it actually doesn't matter if you have that privilege. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want you to answer this here, but I want you to go thinking about this what justifies best justifies using the least privilege what makes it the most advantageous approach well i, I won't answer but i'll ask the opposite question you know the cases where you do need privileges well what now <laughs> what now well that's your least privilege uh, isn't it i mean that's the point right well Okay, least privilege, but there's still privileges and uh, they represent challenges. So, so the next step is really thinking of, okay, how, what do we do with privileges and how do we use those privileges responsibly? And my argument is that you need to, in Kubernetes, you need to do everything responsibly because the, the least privilege principle doesn't really protect you from, from that much. If you're sure, thinking of it in terms of security. With, we're yeah. starting with... Um, the lowest level that we can agree on that's the point so if you if you said um that you want to limit the privileges when you need it having an app then you could talk about the single app integrity so if if you have multiple containers then maybe something's compromised but you don't have 
the one that needed the net admin privileges is completely separate. If it if you don't immediately get access, then it's not going to cause problems for the rest of the that app. It also wouldn't cause problems for the other applications or the platform. Yeah, the exactly. That, that that's doesn't a, fix yeah. other things. Yeah. It won't fix all the other potential issues that are happening. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to work through and say, if you follow this, then it's going to help in whatever we say. It will help in these situations. Yeah, and and I think we should be careful not to not to propose or pretend that these are, are silver bullets. Like the principle of least privilege is a principle that should be followed for a variety of reasons. One of which is security related things, um, and with the goal of frustrating the attacker and where they gain access, they have to take yet another step to get to to escalate or to transfer their, their access to uh, horizontally to, to another location, which increases the risk to, to the attacker. Uh, but it's, it's, not the, it's not the only reason why we want to have least privileges, uh, but it's, it's something that, uh, that uh, is generally a, a good principle to have, but it needs to be applied across, across the board while also understanding that there needs to be other things put in place. It's the reason why uh, in OpenShift environments that SE Linux is recommended, uh, strongly recommended to, to remain on, that people, when they get frustrated with SE Linux, they don't just say, oh, let's just go disable it or disable it entirely through a security control uh, policy in uh, the SEC and the, uh, in their uh, pods, in, in their, in, on, on that specific pod. And so I, I think it's, it's important to, where even if they have privileges that are escalated, that they get enumerated out. These are what the privileges are because in that scenario, it also allows an administrator or an, by administrator, I don't mean a Kubernetes administrator, but as in like the administrative control and leadership and apparatus that is built that within the company to also work out like, well, what systems do we need to spend more time auditing? What's Where do we need to spend more time looking where systems may have may have issues? And things like uh, disk IOPS and similar, yes, they can be negated through careful, control, careful application of EPTF or there are kernel parameters that can help tune that, uh, but it doesn't, it, but you ultimately need to have good uh, observability somewhere. Like there's no, there's there's ways to bypass the uh, the kernel IOPS depending on how it's configured, where you might have right. direct modes that we tend to use. So we have to be very careful on, on how on, on how we on how we approach these these guidelines to say they're not they're not perfect. So, so let me add to that and building on uh, Frederick what you mentioned last time and and Taylor just hinted, the, the principle is not only least privilege but it's also isolated privilege. Uh, we're not just talking, okay, so let's say we have the minimum amount of privilege required, right? It's not going to be zero. Some aspect might require privilege. We want that component as separate as possible exactly to allow that isolation, single point of failure, observability in one location, et cetera. So um, that to me is the, the fuller expression of what this principle is about. Does that make sense? Calling it something like the principle of least and isolated privilege, something like that. Well, don't join them together. Put them as two separate things. Principle of least privileges, principle of isolation. And well, uh, again, I just want to point out that the principle of least privilege was the jumping off point. It can't be a best practice and it also can't be a use case. Use cases are likely to be related to it. So we had to work kind of we work this problem in lots of different ways, one of which is what reducing privilege would, would, would help from actual use cases. Um, and the other is what are typically applied principle of least privilege derived rules that we see in applications. And then we were trying to join them together in the middle. So, you know, security is not, it is clearly tied to principle of least privilege and it's a use case, right? Somebody has invaded one bit of one CNF what would you want to happen at that point? What could you do about that? You could make sure that that CNF doesn't have the power to break other things in its turn. Um, perfectly good use case. 
Yeah, and, and this this breaking up a part of things is makes a lot of sense as well. Like in enter, in enterprise systems, you often see things like policy will say all data at rest must be encrypted. Uh, they'll say the standard is we use AES. The procedure is we use BitLocker on Windows systems to implement AES. And the guidance will be mm -hmm. don't leave your laptop in the car. So we're finding the right level of what we want to call these things. It's like mm -hmm. principle, principle of yeah. least privilege. Which yeah. is like, well, how do we get to procedures? I, I, I again, I, I would also make it clear if it hasn't occurred to people that a best practice isn't necessarily driven by a single use case or, or user story or whatever, right? Security dictates that we probably want to restrict privilege. Um, stability dictates that we probably want to restrict privilege as well. So, but the best practice of how we restrict privilege is one thing. The reasons why we do it is another, and there could be many. Perfectly fine to have that, right? One best practice for two reasons. Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, we'll keep going with this. We do rather hope to have a few kind of outputs in terms of both user stories, use cases, and best practices this week. Uh, we will try, based on prior experience, to make sure that these commits probably live in a branch of their own that are independent of each other so that we can commit the ones that people like and continue to discuss the ones that people have issues with. Otherwise, we get into a log jam where we've got lots of ideas, but we can't get any of them into, into our documentation. Um, but we will keep going with this. And your feedback's welcome, by the way. Um, this actually helps a great deal. Uh, thank you for your comment about um, auditing, Victor. I, I think we do have to weave that in somehow. Um, I'm not quite sure how yet, but, um, but it's a perfectly valid thing to consider. Taylor, back to you. Sounds good. Um, and we're out of time for anything else at the top of the hour. The pull request, we still have some open, including the glossary. Um, I haven't checked if Tal, if you've gone through and responded to some, I think you were gonna accept some and had some comments, but if folks can take a look at that. Uh, the other pull request is a use case for onboarding CNFs to platform. And um, VOOC is gonna be out for the next couple of weeks, but if I think most of the stuff was pretty um, agreeable, but if we can get some plus ones um, on this, then we can get it merged potentially before he's back, unless there's anything that we want to update. So check those two use uh, two pull requests out: the onboarding CNFs and the glossary from Tal. Thanks, everyone. See you next week.